this is going to be a series unless I'm really, really fast at solving these of the hardest ACT math questions. And I'm sure they're applicable to SAT questions as well, but I found a source of 21 of the hardest, supposedly, math questions you would find. And as you can see, I have a nice ASMR inducing medium with actually some ridges in it. That's a that's a cool view. some math today, so come along with me, put some headphones on if you don't already, turn the lights down, get comfortable, and put your thinking caps on, or just, just the headphones, either one that's fine, and let me do some math. So I'd be curious in the comments which ones you guys thought were indeed the most difficult. So let's begin. So let's begin the 21 hardest ACT math questions. When explaining things, it can get a little bit tedious and time consuming. And this is the aftermath of uh, about 20 minutes of me trying to explain this first problem. And I realized I probably should try to make it through a couple more and at a quicker pace than 20 minutes per problem. So with that in mind, I won't delve as deep into the explanations. So this first question here has a, an equation and a graph that corresponds with it. It says the equation is h equals a times t squared plus b times t plus c. And this describes the, the height of a baseball over a certain amount of time. And it's kind of misleading in the sense that it looks like a two, well it actually looks like a, a three-dimensional sketch of what a baseball is doing, and you picture it, this being the height, which it is here, but you kind of picture this being the distance, the horizontal distance when it's really just the time. So, you want to keep that in mind when we're trying to solve these and think through what the question's asking us. So it says, if you alter only this equation's c term, which gives the height at time zero, the alteration has an effect on which of the following? So I'll go through these one at a time. The H intercept. And for this one, all you really need to know is that 
h-intercept is in fact the height at time equals zero. So it kind of gives you that one. And that just means that when t over here is zero, what height are you starting at? What height does this equation tell you the ball should be at? And it's this spot right here. So, next, so our answer would be, it does in fact have an effect on the h-intercept when we alter the c term. So, it is number one, so we can eliminate g, h, right off the bat. Now, number two, the maximum value of y, of h, so, here we'll reference my little doodle. And I drew this, and I think I took about 10 minutes to explain that. The maximum height is entirely relative to the initial height. So whatever the height is, initially, the ball will go up until its velocity upward. As I said, as I tried to write here, V equals zero at the zenith, I suppose you might say. Sorry, I had some company there for a second. I forgot... I was around explaining the, I guess, correlation between the initial height. Oh, that's it, the velocity. Um, the ball initially has a horizontal and vertical velocity. And gravity works in a downward force. That's what these arrows are here. So it doesn't actually affect the horizontal velocity of the ball. So the horizontal velocity will stay relatively constant, minus air drag and effects like that. But the vertical velocity will be up at some initial position, uh, value I mean, and will incrementally decrease until it hits the height at which its velocity is zero because f gravity is in fact trying to f pull it downwards and that has the effect of decreasing the velocity to, uh, to zero and then ultimately making it reverse direction right at this point at which it goes down. To the ground. So all that's to say that, yes, if we change the C term from 3, I just used that as an example, to 0 down here, the maximum height will not be the same. And in fact, the ball will uh, hit the ground a lot sooner. I suppose you could think of it as you're already starting with, you know, some amount of height underneath it, and uh, once it hits its peak, it'll have the distance, vertical distance traveled, plus all that initial height underneath it, whereas if it starts at zero, it only has the distance traveled um, vertically underneath it. So yes, it, it indeed affects the maximum value of h. And now that that narrows it down to only j and k. So basically, 
is the third characteristic affected. The T intercept. And I guess this explanation shows that the T intercept would be the point at which not only does it return back to its initial position, but it, if not zero, it has to go beyond that initial position and hit the ground. Um, or basically, I guess, the T-intercept would be the point at which the height intercepts or intersects the the T axis here. So we will think of it as when the height goes to zero because that's where the T axis is. Axis is. So yeah, if we change the C it will in fact change the change the value of the time at which the ball ends up at a value of zero. So our answer here would be K. It satisfies all three of those conditions. It affects all of them. All right, we made it without taking 30 minutes, but still took a lot longer than I wanted to try to move at a faster yet relaxing clip. All right, so number two here. We have a question for all real numbers, B and C, a little word problem here, that such that the product of C and 3 is B, which of the following expressions represents the sum of C and 3 in terms of, of B? All right, so all we have to do here is break this problem into components. We have real numbers, so B, C equal real numbers, meaning they're not imaginary or irrational. Um, Let's see, rational. Mm, I might, I might be wrong about that, but we know they're not imaginary, and we have a product. The product of C and three is B, so we have C times three. And that equals B. Which of the following expression represents the sum of C and 3 in terms of B? So we want to know what C plus 3 is, but we don't want to use the don't want to use the variable C. We want to use only numbers and B. So here you would take this equation and solve for C. And then once we know what C equals for this equation, we can simply substitute that into that variable right here. And uh, 
C should just equal B divided by 3. And then this becomes B. That becomes v B divided by 3 plus 3. Alright, so let's look back at our options here. Just go ahead and fold this over. And we have B plus 3. Um, no. 3B plus 3. Let's see. What can we do? Can we... So... This is the expression we have here, and we can manipulate it. If I multiplied We look at this, and uh, looks like we have a similar answer. So it's E. E would be our solution there. All right. The next next problem we got is for all x in the domain of the function. Let's see here. Let's see, we got x plus 1. Divided by x cubed minus x. Um, it says, for all x in the domain of that function, this function is equivalent to... And whenever it says that, you can kind of ignore that, because it just means x can't be zero. But uh, when you're solving it in terms of itself, or you're just manipulating the variables, you really don't need to apply that, I don't think. So basically, this one just comes down to which of these can we manipulate this into? Um, the top one is already simplified, but when we have a cube and two of the same variables, what you can try to do is pull out an x, pull out one of those variables, and you're left with, whoop. so I pulled out an x, and I have x squared minus 1 now. Um, does that look like something we have? I see x squared minus 1. That's good, but we can't simplify the rest of it to 1. So, what I want to do is... See, they're looking to see if we remember the difference of squares trick. And this one is particularly tricky because it's hard to forget that 1 is in fact a square of itself. In fact, it's a cube of itself and it's <laughs> actually any root. Um, 
any exponent of itself. And I guess I just mean that you can multiply it by itself as many times as you need and you'll still get one. So the difference of squares is where we take this and it's like when you try to, um, what's the word? Yeah, what's that word? Oh, I forget it. I don't know, you try to simplify a quadratic function into something times something else, and you get So basically the, the rule of difference of squares is if you have a square minus another square, or in other words a difference of two squares, this can decompose into the roots uh, plus each other and the roots minus each other. And you have x plus 1 and x minus 1. And then we have, we can uh, test that by uh, showing you that x times x. So we distribute x to x, and then negative 1, we get x squared. x squared minus um, x, and then we distribute that 1, and we get... 1 times x is x, 1 times negative 1 is negative 1, and negative x plus x is 0, and we are in fact left with x squared plus 1, or minus 1, sorry. So that's all to say that this can be broken up into that. And then we then we have back to our original function. The original function says x plus one divided by x times this, which we just broke up into these two functions. So we have plus 1 and minus 1. And right away your brain should go back into basic training with algebra equations and realize you can you can uh, sniff out that this equals 1. So it's like saying 1 times um, 1 over x times x minus 1, where this one is this thing divided by itself. So anything divided by itself is always 1. So we basically just pull this out and we're left with this. And I would bet that we can find that on our little sheet here. 1 and it looks like it's probably this one. If we just go ahead and distribute that x. So x times x is x squared and x times negative 1 is negative x. And it looks like those two do indeed match up. So, all right. I think we got time for one more.
So we have a, another word problem for a project in home economics class. Kirk is making a tablecloth for a circular table three feet in diameter. So let's let's just go ahead and draw a circle here and the diameter. D equals 3 feet. Now, the finished tablecloth needs to hang down 5 inches over the edge of the table all the way around. So, I would immediately draw a bigger circle and five inches would be, I don't know, extra, call that five. So x equals five inches, so I guess we'll use the, uh, the little tick marks there. And to, to finish the edge of the tablecloth, Kirk will fold under and sew down one inch of the material all around the edge. Kirk is going to use a single piece of rectangular fabric. And that is 60 inches wide. What is the shortest length of fabric in inches? Kirk could use to make the tablecloth without putting any separate pieces of fabric together. And this one's kind of tr tricky. Let's see. Uh, what is this about folding under and sewing down one inch of the material all around the edge? Um... Is that included in the five inches, or is that another inch all around, making it six inches? Should I increase that to six? Hmm, what do I do? say that it's included in the five inches. No, no. Sorry, I, I think I misinterpreted that. Because it needs to hang over five inches, but... That's after he apparently finishes the edge with that extra one inch of material. So, so yeah, I guess X really is six inches after all. See, that was, that was kind of tricky. At least that's how I would interpret it, so... Now, if he has a so he has a rectangular piece of fabric. It is sixty inches wide, or what is that five five feet? five feet, and 
what is the shortest length um yeah basically you want to be able to inscribe a circle in there like that and you want the circle to be three feet plus six feet all around or six inches all around which is adding six inches to each side which is a total of four feet so um how many and it wants to know the answer in inches so we have 48 inches so we need 48 inches that wide so uh say it's 48 inches let's let me see I got the answers over here the question is this one number four okay yeah it is 48 inches that has got to be the trickiest question wording I've ever come across I really hope they don't actually put that on ACT tests. That's ridiculous. Because they... They give you what they call is a width. And it's a rectangle. So you assume that the... If they're giving you the width, you assume that the length that they're looking for is naturally longer. But, I suppose a square is just a, special case of a rectangle, but, uh, I don't know, I, I don't really, I think that's some, and then the one inch thing, that's like, if that was someone delegating a task to a person, this would be probably go down in the history books as the most retarded explanation of what you are looking for ever. I think that's pretty ridiculous. Uh, next time so uh, questions five and six we'll we'll dive into that next time all right guys on that weird note I'll bid you a good night and uh, I hope you sleep well <laughs>